Um, this is my talk. Um, my life as a spyware developer, or why I'm probably going to hell. Um, so here is what we'll be covering in the next hour. Um, I will be doing my presentation. I wasn't sure if that was going to work or not, so I'm glad it did. Um, OK. Um, so who am I? Um, currently my career, I am Integrated Solutions Lead from HCon in uh, the office in Toronto and Chicago. Um, although this is slightly out of date because we just got purchased by Honeywell. Um, so who knows what that job title will be shortly. And basically what that means is I write custom software for power plants. Um, not part of the talk, but kind of like tracking D rates, outages, um, fuel consumption, energy produced, and reports based on that. Um, I've also been doing a lot of NERC SIP work in the past year or so. Um, and in case you don't know, um, NERC SIP is a federal like security <clears throat> uh, regulation, I guess, that all the power plants are now uh, obligated to comply with. And uh, if you don't, the fan the fines could potentially be up to a uh, million dollars per day per infraction, so they're not messing around. Um, previously, I have developed uh, pharmacy systems, online casinos, and dating websites. A little bit of everything. <laughs> and uh, also spyware. Um, and I use the term spyware mainly because uh, a lot of my friends are not technical, and that's a word that they understood. So. Malware is probably more appropriate, but that's the term I've used throughout my presentation. So replace that uh, as you feel necessary. And this is my fourth DEF CON. Um, yeah, it's, and it's an honor to be presenting here. Thank you. Um, so why am I here? Um, I've never seen a talk about uh, this subject, at least not from someone who admitted to actually doing this. I'm sure there may be a few of you in the audience. Um, and I guess it, it, potentially someone could have done this talk already, but I haven't seen it. Um, and if you're here looking to find out any tricks, there aren't any, so sorry about that. Um, and I thought it was interesting. Um, and I only mention this because, uh, you know, I never thought I would be the type that would present at this conference. And, you know, maybe you're thinking the same thing. So. <laughs> If you have an interesting story, I definitely recommend that you uh, present or at least attempt to. Um, yeah, it's been a good experience so far. And also so that you don't do what I did. Um, that's kind of the main lessons learned throughout this, um, as you will see. All right, um, so this story kind of is a bit out of date. So the whole thing started back in 2004. Um, I lived in Edmonton up in Canada, and then I uh, moved to Vancouver, and um, basically I was broke. Um, and this is where I discovered like it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, all my academic friends and social worker friends were not too useful in helping me get a development job. Um, so you know, I had some money saved up, but it was running out. Um, so I was getting a bit desperate. And also I want to say, um, emphasize the fact that I had no security background whatsoever, no spyware, I had no idea. Like I was just, really was just a developer. Um, so I had no like specific skill set before I got into this whole thing. Um, yeah, I found the job on Craigslist and <laughs> like many things on Craigslist, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. Um, I was looking at other places. I had a headhunter, but they didn't really know development stuff, so they were not super useful. Uh, Monster.com. Um, but this is what came up. Um, so I applied. Uh, went down to the office. Um, yeah, the guy, I think it was on a Thursday, interviewed me, and basically at the end of the interview, he's like, if you, you can have the job if you want. Uh, if, if you accept, just show up on Monday. Um, and I did, and um, I think it seemed like to him, who was completely non-technical, that I seemed to know the most, so they made me lead developer. 
So that's about as uh, diligent as they got. And there was five other programmers as well. Um, so the history of this company that uh, hired me, um, so he had these uh, software people and they were doing some other stuff as well that I wasn't involved with. Um, so there was some other shady character out there uh, funding the whole deal, um, but my boss was just kind of running the business that was putting the software together. Um, so they had tried previously um, with a group of outsourced developers from India and uh, they, they put it together and what, apparently it worked quite well. Um, but my boss said that time difference was too much and they had some kind of falling out. Um, so that relationship ended. And it turned out that the falling out was that he didn't pay them. <laughs> um, so he didn't get the source code, um, which you know should have kind of uh, a bit of foreshadowing, if you can't guess. Um, but again, uh, my landlord was expecting me to pay money at the end of the month. so. So that's why we got put together. Um, his former developers were no longer there and uh, he wanted some local people. Um, so here's just uh, some of the overall features of the spyware we developed. Um, nothing too shocking. Uh, the client application where the nasty stuff happens, um, run any application we wanted. So once it was installed, you basically download an exe, whatever one we wanted, and it would run it. Um, not shocking. We, and this was mainly with the intention that we would update our own software, but we could have done whatever we wanted with that. Um, adding links to your favorite list, uh, icons to your uh, browser, shortcuts on your desktop, change your homepage, search provider, um, and also keyword search pop-ups and hyperlinking. So we had a massive XML file with all these keywords in it. Um, for example, flowers. So if you did a Google search or a Yahoo search or whatever uh, uh, search engine we were configured for, um, after you uh, searched it, it would pop, give you a pop-up with the banner ad related to your search term. Um, and it, was, it wasn't like a standard HTML pop-up because it was um, modal, so you couldn't click it into the background. Um, and hyperlinking. So if we found like that word flowers, for example, on the page, we would turn it into a hyperlink. You click on it, it would go through an affiliate link, which I'll get into later, um, where if you bought something off that web page, we would get commission for it. Um, so that was, affiliate uh, abuse was kind of the crux of this application. Um, and it was also checked for updates daily. So the application could be updated or this XML file with all these, all the data in there. Um, on the server side, um, we could track installs, um, updates, like how often they were updating, uh, IP address, where it was coming from, manage multiple campaigns as was the term that was used. Um, so I guess different sources of where the, the spyware was getting installed from. You could see how effective each source was. Um, and we could upload new versions of the software, any file we wanted, and uh, it would get run. Um, so when we were writing this, um, a lot of like antivirus and malware protection software um, is it's pretty stupid. It'll basically look for specific files in specific locations and maybe do a hash check. And if it matches something in their bad list, it will delete the file or remove, attempt to remove it. So to get around this, um, we made each install uh, kind of unique and a variation. So no two installs would be alike. The, the file would never have the same file name. Um, it would never be in the same location. Uh, system 32, program file slash common, like and it, basically any uh, directory on the computer uh, the software could be installed to and each file would have a separate location. Um, and then to get by a hash check, um, some antivirus and malware protection will just check every file regardless and see if it matches its hash check. So if you just throw some garbage at the end of your file, you'll get by that, no problem. And again, like, this is just me as like a regular developer. I just, it's not like, I, it just, just made sense to me. It's not like I was like a security researcher or anything like that. Like it was just made common sense. 
Um, so while I worked there with these basic tricks, no malware protection software was able to remove it or detect it. So I don't know if they needed more time. It was running for a few months, so I don't know. If, if your protection against evil software is defeated by changing a single bit, like, it's not very effective. Um, we started looking into hiding files into alternate data streams, which is basically a not very much used feature of NTFS, where you can basically hide files in the file system. And I think the only thing it's really used for is if you, in newer versions of Windows, if you download a file off the internet and you go to execute it, it'll say, this file was downloaded off the internet, do you want to execute it or not? And that flag is set within alternative data, or alternate data streams. Um, but we ran out of time and just didn't really get anywhere with that. Um, so the big money-making scheme that this piece of software was supposed to do was affiliate hijacking. Um, so basically, every site, like Amazon.com, for example, has an affiliate program. So if you run like a Twilight fan page, at the bottom of the page, you're going to, do you want to buy Twilight the movie or the book? You click on that, um, it goes through your, you, uh, your referral ID, and you'll get commission on the purchases. Um, so basically, that's what we were hoping to abuse to make money off other people's purchases. Um, so we had a list of domain names and a separate XML file, and a list of affiliate links that we had set up. And we had done this for hundreds and hundreds of websites. Well, not me, but the business people that were working for my boss. Um, so if you typed in Amazon.com, uh, our software would pick that up and redirect you through your affiliate link. Um, the only problem with this is if you went to a direct product link, like you had actually clicked on uh, like the Twilight book that you were going to purchase off the fan site, it would redirect you through our affiliate link and then bring you back to the Amazon homepage. So that would probably be a clue that something was going on. Um, and we could have made that smarter as well, I assume. but. We didn't get that far. And like I said, you'll get commission off anything we purchased. And yeah, there was hundreds of links. And you can get these in bundles. So you sign up for one program, and you'll get affiliate links to dozens of websites, for example. And this was in 2004. I'm not sure how this is run now. Um, and we also created a kernel module. Um, so basically, this would hide all the files from the users. So if you open up Windows Explorer and uh, browse to the directories that our files are hiding in, uh, they would no longer show up. Like if you cracked open like a DOS command prompt and did a directory command, it wouldn't show up there either. And even when they were executing, they wouldn't show up in the task manager. Um, and if you managed to delete them or managed to show them somehow, it would automatically download and replace and re-randomize the files once more. Um, and this would probably be called a rootkit now. Like a lot of this stuff, I have terminology for it, but back then, this was just me like, oh, well, this makes sense to do. I wasn't really thinking in any of these uh, terms, I guess. Um, so the technology we used um, on the client side, um, basically an Internet Explorer plugin. And uh, Microsoft calls these browser helper objects. Um, there's not a lot of documentation on them uh, online, but we were just we found out that this is what we needed to do to create our add-on, our malware, uh, to get into IE and integrate with it. Um, but we found enough information to do everything we needed to do. Um, we programmed this in Visual C++ 6, which is a bit archaic. Um, and the other developers definitely resisted this. They wanted to do it all in .NET, which is a much easier language for sure, but also requires that you download the 200 plus meg uh, .NET library, which is not something you really want to do if you're trying to infect someone's computer. Um, every version of Windows since 95 has uh, Visual Studio 6 libraries built into it. So anything you, you build in C++ 6 or VB6 um, will just run out of the box. Uh, on the server side, uh, the web interface was done in PHP and uh, MySQL backend. So just tracking statistics. Um, uploading new versions, and the GUI to maintain this whole system. Um, and everything was hosted on Russian servers, guaranteed to never take down content, and uh, no matter how many nasty letters they got or who they came from. And true to their promise, they never did. Um, I don't know if they're still around. I probably have that in some archived email somewhere. Um, it'd be interesting to see what their, their name is, because I don't remember off the top of my head. 
Um, so you might be wondering, why would anyone want to install this wonderful software? Um, and basically, uh, my boss said he would pay $10,000 to whoever found a way to remotely install our software. And I took that challenge up. Um, when you take a job like this for money, an offer like this is enticing. Um, so this is another surprise. Um, it exploits an Internet Explorer flaw. It's shocking. Um, so our exploit and any exploit with remote execution requires two things. You need to get the file on the computer and out of the protected IE zones, like, um, like if you go into the security panel of Internet Explorer, you've got like trusted sites, local internet, that kind of thing. Those are the zones we're talking about. So we want to bust out of those zones. And you also want to execute the file once you get it on the hard drive. Um, so again, me not really being a hacker, and I don't claim to be leet at all, but um, I basically signed up for security mailing lists and just sat there until something came along that looked like could be used for this. And we found one pretty quickly. Um, what basically, you'd create a custom CHM file, which I think had the EXE embedded into it. Um, and that, those are basically help files. Com I think it stands for uh, compiled HTML. And um, for some reason, Windows Media Player would be able to execute it once it was embedded in this CHM. Um, I, can't, I can't remember the exact name of this exploit. Um, it came out just before Service Pack 2 for XP came out, and Microsoft actually made uh, security a bit of a priority. Um, and that shut down this exploit, but people don't patch their machines, so it's not actually that big of a deal. Um, yeah, and my boss was convinced that this was not illegal. And, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Who knows? Uh, I'm also from Canada, so I don't know if the laws are different there than they are here. Um, plus, everything was hosted on, in Russia, so that adds more fun to the mix. Um, and I'll show you why he didn't think it was illegal. Um, we basically created a custom installation dialog. Um, and my boss never paid the $10,000. <laughs> and I don't say this to make you feel bad for me, because I definitely don't expect that. I just want to, like, this industry, surprise, surprise, attracts a lot of scumbags. And uh, <laughs> yeah, don't trust their word. Um, I think basically what happened is the guy who was funding the operation gave him the money, and then he gambled it all away. Because um, apparently I found out later that he was also a gambling addict. Um, yeah, so I'm, there was lots of promises for the money, but not actually any of the money, which is slightly different. Not worth nearly as much. Um, so if you remember back in the glory days of Internet Explorer 6, um, whenever something asked to uh, basically uh, become integrated with Internet Explorer 6, you would get this dialog, which was like, I'm not a usability expert, but this is insane. Like, do you want to install and run a .cab file, which your grandma is not going to know what that is? And it says the publisher cannot be determined due to the problems below. The test route has not been enabled as trusted route. Yeah, so very clear. Anyway, like, I don't even think you really need to use an exploit. Like, I think there's a certain percentage of people that will click yes no matter what. Um, so, but anyway, we had our exploit and we were using it. Um, so this is our installation dialog, and it's a bit more devious. Um, I didn't put this together and I didn't word it, but it's pretty hilarious. Um, so it starts at the top, browser enhancer. I'll read this out because I don't know if people at the back can see it. So browser enhancer in big bold letters, like that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, congratulations, you have been awarded a browser enhancement exclamation mark. <laughs> Key features of our software include, number one, giving the user another opinion while, they're, while they surf the web broadening their experience and knowledge of the web. I don't know what that means, and broadening is also spelled wrong. <laughs> um, number two, giving, giving options to search the web with great search engines. Um, and three, providing the user with other partner software free of charge. <laughs> um, 
you have previously agreed to our terms and conditions to get this step of installation and can review these, st these terms by clicking right on this link. So this actually would bring up our terms and conditions and it was, it was long. Like it was like 20 pages if you probably printed it out and basically boiled down to like, we own your machine. <laughs> um, and if you can close all the pop-ups, we'll let you use it once in a while. Um, and the last paragraph is pretty good. Like, if you change your mind and would like to continue the installation, please uncheck the box below and close this window. If you leave the box checked and close the window, we will finish your installation free of charge. <laughs> um, and there's a little checkbox just off to the bottom left there. And I think it was even more devious than that. So like, back in the day there was a lot of pop-ups. Pop-up blockers weren't really integrated into browsers. So when you saw something pop up, you would automatically just close it right away. Like it was like almost completely subconscious. Um, so if you had done that, you would have installed the software. And I, like, I probably would have fell for this. Um, so if you click the X in the top right or the, the big close this window button, um, it would have the same effect. And I think even if you uncheck the box, what you actually had to do was um, go to the left hand icon at the top left, little MFC uh, icon there. There's a custom uh, context menu item added saying exit without installing. So you had to uncheck the box and then close it from there. So it's even more diabolical because everyone uses that left hand context menu all the time, right? Um, so I covered most of this custom installer, bypasses standard install method. Uh, legal disclaimer, and my boss claimed this was not needed, but just in case. And you know what? He might actually be right. Like this, and, and this dialogue probably only would, like the vast majority of people probably would have still got hung up by it. Um, but it does present the terms and conditions. So you know what? He, like, he could have been right. Um, but again, I'm not a lawyer. So. And it's tricky not to install, obviously. So how do we deploy this installer? Because um, again, even with this message, you're not going to want to do it. So this is another thing that I've since learned to call drive-by downloads, but back then it just, it just seemed like the way to do it. And I didn't come up with this idea. Um, I think one of my bosses got this idea from some other scam they were pulling. Um, so putting the exploit in banner ads. Um, so basically, websites don't know what ads they run. They sign up with an ad network and they agree to host uh, their ads and they get paid for it. Um, and I think there was, you can configure like, I only want certain categories. I don't, they definitely don't have anything like they get to view every single ad before it shows up on their website. Um, this was five years ago, or almost six years ago now. Um, so I don't know if it's different, but that's how it was back then. And also, as someone who was serving up these ads, we didn't know what, what websites it would show up on. I think uh, the biggest site we got put on was yellowpages.com or whitepages.com and uh, the, the installs went through the roof once it got on there. Um, so basically, um, the ads are hosted on our servers. The ad networks, I guess, don't want to host them their themselves. Um, if they did, they probably could have detected half this stuff and done something about it, but, and maybe they do that now, but that's how it was done back then. Um, so you would run the ad campaign for a few days, and once, I guess, they were satisfied that it was legit, we would then open up our zero by zero iframe which is essentially another page uh, that had the exploit into it. Um, and we could set it up so that you were, it was only configurable to a fraction of viewers, so like 0.05% if you knew you were going to get a lot of traffic, um, only because it would be harder to track down, for people to track down where it was coming from. So if you went to another machine, you wouldn't get exposed to it again. Um, but my boss was greedy and this was basically cranked up to 100 all the time. And we, we would check for, like, if you were running a Mozilla browser or some Opera or something like that, we wouldn't expose the iframe to you because it clearly wouldn't work. It was uh, IE6 specific. And we would also keep track of the IP addresses on the server and not show it to the same IP address twice. Um, and we'd set a cookie as well, but, uh, you know, we didn't really rely on that because the user actually has control over their cookies. Or maybe not, depending on which talks you've seen. Um, so how does this whole business make money? Um, so we ended up with over 12 million installs of the software. Um, which I don't, 
I don't know, it could, you might even, with our ability to run whatever executable we wanted, I guess you could maybe even call this a botnet. I don't know. Like, we weren't thinking in those terms at all, but. So guess how much money our software made with 12 million installs? Does anyone want to shout out some numbers? <laughs> um, not a dime. <laughs> so it's really depressing that you have this evil, shitty software and <laughs> you've installed it on 12 million of grandma's computers and no money was made on it. Um, so the funny thing is, like affiliate programs for these websites, like Amazon.com and uh, everyone else, they, they know people are going to abuse their affiliate system. So they have all this fraud protection in place. So they're watching out for it. So they'll watch out to it to the degree that they will not pay you, but they will still continue to allow these pieces of software to serve up their ads and allow people to buy uh, whatever they're selling through them. Um, so they could easily just shut off the, the banner ads because they're the ones actually hosting them or like at least put up a message saying like you've been infected with something, something illegitimate is giving you these pop-ups. But they're willing to take your money but they're not willing to pay the scam artists that are actually making it happen. So that's interesting. Again, I don't know if it's different now but that's how it was back then. Um, but my boss still made a lot of money. Um, so this is interesting. So how was this done? Um, so our software would make money by installing other people's software. Um, basically, you could make around 10 cents per install of someone else's software. Um, I think it ranged from as little as 5 cents to as much as 25 cents, depending on the package. And you know, some of this might have been like legitimate software, but the majority of it was other spyware with people convinced that they can make money where we did not using the same techniques. Um, so my boss would package as much spyware as he could get paid for around 20 different packages into one big payload and then try to get paid for all of it. Um, and he probably would have done more, but at that point your computer is essentially unusable. <laughs> um, and they would only, the companies would always argue about the number of actual installs they had, but um, so they would generally only pay around 60% of installs, but when you're simply by opening up an iframe, you're getting 20 million installs, and this was over a couple months, um, times about 10 cents per 20 different packages. Like, that's, that's very easy money and a lot of it. Um, so what happens when you install 20 pieces of spyware at once? Um, so some programmers were a bit lazier than ours, and they actually would install, they would have like a, like a 900K executable and attempt to download the .NET framework, which is like 200 megs. And you, and the, you can't, they didn't even do it silently. So you can see like, if you let it download it, it would actually, like you'd see the progress bar and the .NET <laughs> framework getting installed. Like, <laughs> and I'm, sh I, I, I'm actually convinced that the .NET framework allows you to do silent installs. It's, they were just lazy. Um, your computer will never be slower. We had a series of uh, test machines and with images we would just refresh all the time to test this out and it was, it was brutal. Like you'd open up Internet Explorer and it would just be nothing but search toolbars. <laughs> um, and even some of the pop-ups that would happen would have them too. Um, and they would try to un uninstall each other. Because <laughs> They know if your machine's vulnerable and you've got their software installed on it, like there's a good chance that they had other people's stuff installed on it too, but they only want their pop-up showing, not other people's, so they would try to uninstall each other. Um, and this included installing antivirus. So if, if your software using basic polymorphic techniques like we were, like, and I wasn't an expert on this stuff, like, um, and they knew that antivirus wasn't picking up their software. They would install antivirus um, with the hopes that it would uh, remove everyone else's. Um, and I don't know, but maybe they were getting paid to install the antivirus, which would be really interesting, actually. <laughs> um, so, do you want to be a millionaire? Because you can. Um, 
So all the technical stuff I've covered is easy. Like any developer should be capable of this. All you need is access to Google and you can figure this stuff all out yourself. Like it's not rocket science at all. Like there's, there's nothing difficult in, on a technical level of any of this stuff. Um, all the work is making like having the business people sitting there and make sure they get paid for all the installs. Um, and I think that's mainly what my boss was dealing with. Um, but the technical part is like, it's all out there on the internet. Like it's even on like Microsoft sites. This is how you create Internet Explorer add-ons. Like you, once you've got that, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and my boss was convinced that no laws were broken, and I, that's mainly because of the custom installer. Um, and I think it didn't really even hurt the. You probably lost like maybe five percent of installs by throwing it up there, which is like insignificant. Um, if it covers your ass legally, and he was very. He did not want to get go to jail, um, and you know what? That may have worked. Um, I'm not sure. And all you need is basically no conscience. Um, I've worked for a few internet companies, and it just seems to attract, especially well, web startups. I'll say, and it just seems to attract like the worst scumbags. They seem to think like the internet's this big get rich quick scheme, and uh, yeah, I basically have a policy of not working for web startups anymore. I've been burned too many times. And you also need people you can trust. Like, as I've said, all of this stuff is super easy to put together. Um, and once people are working and are, are doing this, they, like, everyone gets the same idea at around the same time. Like, my boss is making how many millions of dollars for no effort? Like, why do I need him? So everyone that was working for my boss basically went off on their own and tried to do the same thing. Um, to the point where my boss only worked with family at that point. Um, because he knew he could trust them. Everyone else like uh, tried to go it all, out on their own. Um, so how did this all end? Um, but, yeah, and I covered this, but much like other internet companies I worked for, they basically locked their doors and stopped paying everyone. Once it became apparent the venture capital ran out or they just thought they'd take the money and run or whatever. Again, I don't want you to feel bad for me, but uh, that is what happened. And of course it was on payday. Like he was around every day that month except that one day for some reason. Um, and it also happens to be the time that uh, your rent is due as well. Um, so I found out after the fact that they, the company was founded at an AA meeting. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that's not really relevant, but I thought it was interesting and weird, but apparently that's what happened. And I guess probably like, you know, they, my boss fell off the wagon, that's why he uh, took off, so, but I didn't know this till after the fact. Um, so I went on to work for the person who was paying my boss and funding the whole operation. Um, again, like I was determined to, I knew what I was doing was not great, uh, but I also needed money to eat and live. So I, once I saved up enough money and gave myself some time to find a new job, I was gonna do that. Um, so this surprise kind of threw up, uh, messed up those plans. <clears throat> so yeah, I went on to work for him. He knew I was doing most of the work anyway. Software was basically done, so what did he need everyone else for? And I did that for a few months, uh, I think two and a half months, until I saved up enough money to finally get out of there and like start a real job search. Um, and I was working like about 80 hours a week because I was doing the work of about five people um, and I can do that for a while, but I can't do it for a few months. Uh, it was a bit of a wreck. And I like to be able to sleep at night. Um, so the fact is, like, I think all of us know we should keep our patches up to date and we, we know how to browse safely, or at least we think we do. So most of this stuff is going on, like, grandma's computer that only has a computer she, so she can look at her grandkids' pictures on Facebook. So it's, it's a pretty scummy thing to do and, you know, I never liked it, but I had definitely had enough at the end. Um, and this period on my resume is listed as contract work. <laughs> which is accurate, but I definitely don't get into the specifics at all. Um, so my boss was also doing other scams, and I wasn't involved on these, but I thought I'd list them out for you anyway. Um, so trying to uh, throw search en engine results, I don't know the specifics of it, but um, like certain search terms like, like asbestos lawsuits are highly valuable to search engines because the ads that are associated with them are, I think, the highest in the business. 
Um, so this is also known as search engine optimization. Uh, so I don't know where the legit version starts and ends. Um, and they add their own search engines with paid top results. So they would get other people to pay for top links to uh, their search engine. And they were, like I saw a couple of them, and they were never websites I'd ever heard of. Um, and I'm assuming they only ever got used through uh, other malware that got installed. Um, and this other thing with news video pop-ups, where uh, apparently the most valuable pop-up to show is a video. Um, so they had a specific version of software to uh, force users to watch a video a day. And that's where all the, the biggest money is for advertising, I guess, at least four years ago. Um, so what can be done about spyware or malware? Um, so as long as there's money to be made, someone will try, um, even if money can't actually be made, which is kind of what we saw. As long as they can get a venture capitalist person to give the money to attempt it, um, this software will exist. Um, yeah, so I don't think this is going away anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, or even if you think you can make money off people who think they can. So this is kind of where we ended up, because our software didn't make any money but we were making our money off people who thought they could. So it's very meta and like, it's basically a big pyramid scheme. As long as someone's willing to pay you to do it, um, even if it never makes a dime, um, they will try. Um, and I think blacklisting is just useless. I, you know, maybe it's a bit smarter now, but as I mentioned, if your evil software can get by the system by changing a single bit, like it's, your blacklist will always be out of date. There's always be around, ways around it. Um, so you're basically, you have a list of software that you don't want your computer to run. Um, and it will always be behind. The attacker will always have the advantage. Um, so I think whitelisting is the future, at least should be. Um, I've seen whitelisting. So it's basically, rather than you can't run these programs, it's you can only run these programs. And any other executable that gets on the system um, is basically denied access of anything. Um, and I think these can be made consumer friendly. Um, I've seen some enterprise versions of the software and it works quite well. It's not perfect, but at least I know if I got a bad piece of software on, on my machine, I can go to a list and see like, oh, it's that one and I can remove it and it's no longer a problem. Um, and as for why whitelisting software is not like out there nearly as much as antivirus or malware protection, even though I see it as vastly more significant, uh, effective. Um, I guess you just can't make money selling virus signature updates with it. Um, so I imagine at some point this will be baked into Windows or something like that. It almost has to be. Because um, it doesn't make sense for all the software to not be polymorphic. And it's like I could do it, so anyone can do it. Uh, so it's only a matter of time before all this stuff is. And then blacklisting gets you nowhere. Um, so what did I learn? Um, creating spyware is not hard. Um, I did it. I had no specific security background. Um, just vague ideas what I thought it should do, and I made it do it. Um, it wasn't rocket science in the least. Um, and you can easily make a lot of money on the internet if you've got no scruples. It's kind of depressing. Um, so, yeah, the software will be here always. Um, AV and uh, malware protection seems almost useless. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong or maybe it's smarter than I think it is, but I'm, I wasn't, it was shockingly easy to get around it. Um, this software is not going away. And again, back to people thinking they can make money on it. It's just kind of depressing, like, as much of this stuff gums up our machines and all the spam we get to think that it's all for nothing, like, like not even a single person at the other end is benefiting from it monetarily, like, <laughs> slightly depressing. And this is kind of the note I want to end on. Um, it's not worth compromising your ethics for money. Um, I did it because I was broke. I knew it was wrong. I did it anyway. I don't know, maybe I should ask my parents for money or something, but you know, it's, it's just not worth it. So stay away from these scumbags because they'll rip you off in the end anyway. And uh, yeah, yeah it's, your, your honor is worth more. Um, and that's basically it.
Um, I'll be in the question uh, room at the end of the hallway, so if you have any questions or want more technical details, because I was pretty light on that, I'm more than willing to, s to be there for an hour.